Hello, I'm Eric Strong from Strong Medicine, and today in this ongoing video series on an approach to symptoms, I'll be discussing an approach to chronic nausea and vomiting, which will also include conditions of recurrent nausea and vomiting. This video will also focus on just those pathologies in which the nausea and vomiting is a prominent feature of the patient presentation, not just when it's a minor symptom in a much broader illness. There are a few relevant terms that come up when discussing nausea and vomiting. The first is regurgitation. This is the involuntary and relatively effortless movement of esophageal or gastric contents into the mouth without accompanying abdominal wall contractions. There's usually not nausea accompanying regurgitation, and it is best not to consider it vomiting as the diagnostic framework for regurgitation is different and significantly smaller than that for nausea and true vomiting. It's most typical of esophageal pathology, such as esophageal structures, and a motility disorder called echolasia. As sort of the opposite of regurgitation, retching is heaving with forceful abdominal contractions as if to vomit, but without the expulsion of any esophageal or gastric contents. While the etiologies of chronic nausea and vomiting are quite different than those of acute nausea and vomiting, categorization within the diagnostic framework is roughly similar. For example, etiologies can fall within the GI system. But instead of GI being subdivided into infectious versus non-infectious, as it is with, with acute pathologies, in chronic pathologies, it's best to consider organic versus functional or motility etiologies. Organic etiologies include gastroesophageal reflux disease, peptic ulcer disease, gallstones, chronic pancreatitis, IBD, and malignant bowel obstruction from cancer of the colon, small intestine, or stomach. Functional GI pathology includes gastroparesis, which is a disorder in which there is delayed gastric emptying in the absence of mechanical obstruction. Cyclic vomiting syndrome is a condition characterized by recurrent periods of profound nausea lasting several days, separated by longer asymptomatic stretches of weeks to months, which some experts believe to have a similar pathogenesis to migraines. Chronic intestinal pseudo-obstruction is a motility disorder in which uh, presents as a chronic bowel obstruction and may have dilated loops of bowel on imaging, but without any identifiable mechanical explanation or on either imaging or endoscopy. Chronic nausea and vomiting syndrome sounds like a nonspecific catch-all term, but it's actually considered to be a specific functional diagnosis. The diagnostic criteria for it is at least one episode of nausea or vomiting per week for at least three months, with an initial onset of any nausea or vomiting for at least six months previous, and with no alternative explanation after routine evaluation. In the past, Patients with this syndrome were often labeled as having psychogenic vomiting, but this term has fallen out of favor because these patients do not necessarily have an underlying psychiatric disease. To what extent chronic nausea and vomiting syndrome represents a single distinct pathology versus a term to catch patients with a variety of other undiagnosed diseases is not currently known. And then there are two other functional disorders, irritable bowel syndrome and functional dyspepsia, which can present with nausea and vomiting, but they are not the most prominent symptom in either. In IBS, the primary symptom is changes in bowel habits, while in functional dyspepsia, the most prominent symptoms are epigastric pain or postprandial fullness. Constipation is frequently claimed by laypersons and medical references intended for laypersons as a common cause of chronic nausea and vomiting, but its role as a direct cause is significantly exaggerated. When constipation and chronic nausea and vomiting do coexist, it's usually either coincidental or there is a higher level of pathology that is causing both, such as a GI malignancy, IBS, or chronic intestinal pseudo-obstruction. Moving to the next category, the central nervous system, nausea and vomiting are frequently associated with migraines. Intracranial tumors are also in this category. Within the vestibular system, normally responsible for balance and sensing when our body is in motion, nausea and vomiting can be manifestations of a condition called benign paroxysmal positional vertigo caused by debris within the semicircular canals of the inner ear. Motion sickness is not a disease, but rather an exaggerated normal physiologic response to motion, which can lead to nausea, vomiting, 
vertigo, and headache. Metabolic etiologies include uremia, adrenal insufficiency, hyponatremia, and hypercalcemia. Virtually any medication can cause nausea, but among those that are most common to do this on a chronic basis are opiates. However, there is also a well-described phenomenon in which nausea in an individual is not caused by any one specific medication per se, but is caused by the ingestion of multiple meds all at the same time, which can be prevented by spacing the meds out from one another. Among recreational drugs, the one most commonly associated with chronic nausea and vomiting is cannabis, typically marijuana, leading to a specific condition called cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. This condition is seen predominantly in young men who have used cannabis daily for many years. The existence of the condition can seem paradoxical to patients and clinicians alike due to the frequent use of cannabis to treat chronic nausea and vomiting in other patients. Last is the miscellaneous category in which there is pregnancy and an extreme variant of morning sickness known as hyperemesis gravidarum. Psychiatric disease, including anxiety and eating disorders, can be associated with chronic nausea and vomiting. While some references still list psychogenic vomiting as a distinct entity here, as previously noted, patients with this problem are more appropriately labeled as having chronic nausea and vomiting syndrome, which is categorized as a functional GI condition. And finally, there is a condition called rumination syndrome, which isn't a cause of nausea and vomiting, strictly speaking, but is instead categorized by frequent effortless and painless regurgitation of recently ingested food, which is then either spat out or chewed again and re-swallowed. It's classically observed in children with developmental delay, but can also be seen in adults. Among all these conditions, the ones that are particularly common causes of chronic or recurrent nausea and vomiting are gastroparesis, migraines, motion sickness, polypharmacy, and pregnancy. How do we evaluate a patient with chronic nausea and vomiting? Starting with a history, try to distinguish true vomiting from regurgitation. Bringing up minimally digested food within minutes of ingestion is more consistent with regurgitation from esophageal pathology rather than true vomiting. Ask what has been the duration and pattern of the symptoms. While all causes of chronic nausea and vomiting wax and wane in severity, some diagnoses characteristically cause very discrete episodes or exacerbations. Among GI conditions, this is most classic with cyclic vomiting syndrome, but is also observed in gastroparesis, IBD, IBS, and chronic pancreatitis. What is the character of the vomit? The presence of material that looks like coffee grounds is suggestive of bleeding in the GI tract. Are there any associated symptoms? Abdominal pain that improves after vomiting can be seen in gastroparesis, whereas abdominal pain that persists unchanged by vomiting is more typical for flares of chronic pancreatitis. Heartburn, a layperson term for burning retrosternal pain after eating, suggests GERD. Prominent concurrent diarrhea or constipation suggests a motility disorder like IBS or chronic intestinal pseudoobstruction. Prominent headaches occurring with nausea suggest migraines. Vertigo, tinnitus, and hearing loss all suggest pathology of the vestibular system. And a compulsion to take warm showers during episodes of nausea is frequently observed in cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. The pathophysiology behind this distinctive symptom is unknown. A past medical and surgical history, particularly a history of diabetes, which is a common cause of gastroparesis, and prior episodes of acute pancreatitis, which suggests the possibility of chronic pancreatitis. Medication history, particularly focusing on any changes that were made in the weeks prior to the onset of nausea and vomiting. And substance abuse, paying particularly close attention to the abuse of alcohol and marijuana. Moving to the focused physical exam, key components are the vitals, a thorough abdominal exam, a screening neuro exam, looking for findings like nystagmus or hearing loss, and a retinal exam to identify the presence of papilla edema, which is swelling and blurring of the optic disc caused by increased intracranial pressure that might be seen with a tumor. Commonly ordered tests include a complete metabolic panel looking both for diagnostic clues, 
as well as looking for complications that chronic nausea and vomiting might cause, like hypokalemia or metabolic alkalosis. A hemoglobin A1c to screen for diabetes, the presence of which increases the risk of gastroparesis, as mentioned. Some additional tests that are done for some patients include a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis, an EGD, which is an acronym for esophagogastroduodenoscopy. This is a procedure in which a flexible camera is inserted through the mouth into the upper GI tract to directly visualize pathology of the esophagus, stomach, and duodenum. The instrument used, called an endoscope, can take biopsy samples and even treat a variety of pathologies at the time of the procedure. Another test is gastric emptying scintigraphy, more commonly known as a gastric emptying scan, which is a test that utilizes the oral ingestion of radio-labeled food to measure the time it takes food to pass from the stomach into the small intestine. This test is specifically used to diagnose gastroparesis. Esophageal pH monitoring can help diagnose GERD. And last, brain imaging is ordered when there is suspicion of intracranial pathology. How can we put all these questions and tests together into a diagnostic algorithm? Well, everyone should start off with a history, the focused physical exam discussed a minute ago, a complete metabolic panel, a hemoglobin A1c, and for females of reproductive age, a pregnancy test. Sometimes there will already be a specific diagnosis strongly suggested, such as migraines, BPPV, or a metabolic derangement, in which case one should continue a focused evaluation for that specific condition as appropriate. Otherwise, subsequent tests depend on a few features of the presentation. For example, in a patient who also reports chronic headaches, inconsistent with migraines, has papilledema or focal neural findings, brain imaging is usually warranted. If the patient is on a potentially causative medication, there should be a diagnostic trial off the medication if this is possible. For everyone else, and in those for whom a diagnostic trial of potentially causative med was not helpful, get an EGD. If the diagnosis is not established from EGD, and GERD is on the differential diagnosis based on the history, the next step is esophageal pH monitoring. If this is negative, or GERD was not on the differential diagnosis to begin with, the next steps are a gastric emptying scan and a CT of the abdomen and pelvis. By now, most patients will have a diagnosis established. However, if not, and if the symptoms are severe, some additional testing that might be considered include CT or MR enterography and a wireless motility capsule. This is also the point in time when some patients might be given a diagnosis of chronic nausea and vomiting syndrome at which point the workup usually stops. The key takeaway points of this video. Nausea and vomiting can be caused by pathology of the GI system, vestibular system, brain, metabolic derangements, medications, chronic cannabis use, or psychiatric illness. Particularly common causes of clinical presentations in which chronic nausea and vomiting are prominent symptoms include gastroparesis, migraines, motion sickness, polypharmacy, and pregnancy. Although relatively uncommon, cyclic vomiting syndrome and cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome are important, underappreciated causes of chronic vomiting. In addition to the history and exam, a metabolic panel, a pregnancy test, and a hemoglobin A1c, other important tests indicated for some patients include an EGD, CT of the abdomen and pelvis, and a gastric emptying scan. That's it for this video on chronic nausea and vomiting. Consider subscribing to Strong Medicine for more videos like this and those on a variety of other medical topics.